Welcome to our weekly Come Follow Me video. This week we will be discussing Alma 43 through 52. Several chapters this week, so we'll get right on into this. A uh, little background that may help us understand what we're reading about here. For example, we reviewed weeks ago some of the stories and the histories from Lehi and his descendants all the way down to Zarahemla. I want you to look at this screen here for a moment and realize we're going to go back to King Mosiah for a moment as a good starting point. And remember Alma, we call Alma the Elder, was part of this group over here and brought his people, as did the people of uh, Ammon when he helped Limhi's people all come back to the land of Zarahemla and King Mosiah. Mosiah was the final king. Now that plays an important role here because everything's of their time frame is based on when Mosiah died and turned the kingdom over to the first king, which is not this Alma, but Alma the Younger. So let's take a look at the schedule from here. Again, I put this on a little small screen here. After Mosiah was the final king, which is the same Mosiah that the book of Mosiah is named after, Alma the Younger becomes the first king chief judge. That's Alma's son. Remember, the sons of Mosiah didn't want to be king, and Alma the younger didn't want to be king, but he became the first chief judge. If you recall that after a while, he was not only the prophet and the first chief judge, he realized that's just too much to do. He did not have enough time to, to serve in the ministry. So he turns over the first chief judge over to Nephiah, who becomes the second chief judge. And he becomes just the prophet at that time. Now we've learned that Alma the Younger has three sons, Helaman, Shiblon, and Coriantum. Nephiah, in today's reading, also uh, turns over the chief judge to his son, whose name is Pahoran. That's important in today's story. So let's take a look at a few things now inside of the story. If you'll go to Alma 43, the first couple of verses tell us that Alma is and his three sons are going to go preach. So here again, here you know the names. Now we've had the stories of Helaman, who now is the record holder, or will be. Shiblon, uh, a good son, served in a mission. Coriantin was the son who had all of those problems, but apparently is a repentant person because he goes on the mission with his father at this time. Now, let's see in verse 1 and 2 where they go. Their, this mission of theirs, all it says is they're not resting, they're going on a mission, because in verse 3, we're going to return to the account of the wars of the Nephites and the Lamanites in the 18th year of the reign of the judges. So it's been 18 years since Mosiah turned over the chief judge to Alma. And a few years since Alma's turned it over to Nephiah. So now you know at least a time period in here. Verse 4 tells us that the Zoramites become, became Lamanites. Now remember, it is Alma and his sons that go teach the Zoramites. Anyone that would repent, and it was usually the poor and the ones that got kicked out of the synagogue. That's Alma 31, 32. 33, and so forth, they uh, join the Nephites, but everyone else, including Zoram, they leave and go join the, ne the Lamanites. And it says in here that they're going to prepare for war. And this section with the next week's section become known as the war chapters. But I want to be careful when we say that because it's not one giant war. It is a series of different wars with time periods of peace in between. And sometimes we clump them all together, but Mormon makes it clear that he's recording these, war, these wars. So there's got to be a reason. So let's take a look at this. If you go to verse 5, that the Lamanites come into a land called Antionum. And Zarahemna is the leader. So again, I've showed you this map previously, and I know it's not a really good copy. So let me just tell you where you can go and see it for yourself. This is the map on the last page of the Book of Mormon Seminary Teacher Manual. Again, it's not to tell us where this is located in North or South America. Scholars have argued, debate, there's theories that some believe this was all in North America, in the Ohio, Michigan, New York area. Some people think it's down in Panama. 
Some think it's in uh, Mexico. There's lots of d debates and arguments. No one really knows. For right now, this map is just to show us the relationship between towns, as it says in the Book of Mormon. For example, uphill, we have the, the Lamanites in the land of Nephi. Down in the land of Zarahemla. So, and, and we have the major river side on that runs through and separates the two lands and so forth. There's several other people who have put maps together, and, and they're all pretty good. But if we look here, that in verse 5, the Zoramites and a leader by the land, man by the name of Zarahemna go to the land of Antionum, which is somewhere uh, south of Nephiah, which we know was destroyed. Morianton and Lehi are on the coast. We know that they're in, involved in this week. Helam and so forth. So you can kind of get a good look at some of these towns. So again, this story here, we introduce Zarahemna, who is a horrible, evil guy, and he's just in this chapter. Verse 16 introduces uh, Chief Captain Moroni, who I hope becomes a favorite, and he's set, he spans several chapters. And there's the great battle between Moroni and Zarahemna. The only thing I want to mention about Moroni is he must be special. If you're reading these chapters and realize that it's probably this guy that Mormon names his own son after, and he has a thousand years of records, and he can name his son anybody he wants, and he picks this guy. Uh, this is an interesting, uh, an interesting man, a great, great man. No wonder Mormon spent so much time talking about him. Plus, he can relate to him. Time of warfare. Mormon lives in a time of warfare and so forth. Okay, let's go to chapter 45. Uh, 44 is the great battle between Moroni and Zarahemna. Let's go to 45 then. In chapter 45, Alma is talking to his son, Helaman. He asks questions that are really interesting. Basically, he's like, do you have a testimony? Take a look at those first eight verses in chapter 45 and see why is Alma asking that. Because verse 9, 10, 11 in there, Alma's going to tell him of a secret, a prophecy that he had revealed to him that the Nephites were going to be de destroyed. But he makes Helaman, who's the record keeper, promise not to tell anybody until after the prophecy is fulfilled. In other words, Mormon's time period. So interesting in there. Also in there is verse 18. That Alma, I'm scrolling down to that, verse 18, Alma departs out of the land of Zarahemla, and we don't know where he goes. Now, here is some interesting, where are we at in this time period? Well, we're at 73 BC. Some have speculated, and it's just speculation, that he, in a land of wealth and gold, maybe wanted to be uh, have the privilege of seeing the birth of the Savior. Uh, we don't know that. And there's others. There's, in fact, there's three of them here in America that, in the Book of Mormon, disappear that uh, we don't know where they go. Uh, Samuel the Lamanite's one of them, right? So where do they go? We don't know. But in this case, is it possible that he's actually young enough to, to travel and in 73 years from this time, roughly, be able to witness the birth of the Savior? I don't know. He would be very old by the time he got there, but it's possible. But anyway, we don't know where he goes. Uh, the writers here seem to believe that he was taken up like Moses was. But again, we don't know. Well, these chapters say a lot of, about things that maybe you can see what's going on in the world today. We have enemies attacking without. We have uh, pestilence and diseases. We have fighting from within. We have conspirators who want to take and overthrow the government. We have groups uh, protesting. We have miracle healings with natural herbs and remedies. All things that are uh, popular by at least some people in the world we live in today. So let's go to chapter 46. Chapter 46. Here we have some civil unrest uh, in this chapter. Someone else wants to be king. They want to change the rule on the, the system of government. Amalekiah wants to be the king in this case. And in this pattern, in verse 4, He's getting the lower judges to side with him. In other words, you make me the king, 
and I'll make all you lower judges high-level rulers in my kingdom. And verse 8 is going to tell us why Mormon put this amazing story in the Book of Mormon. Verse 8, whenever you see, thus we see, this is commentary by the author. In this case, it's Mormon. Thus we see how quick the children of men do forget the Lord their God. Yea, how quick to do iniquity and to be led away by the evil one. Now, regardless of what political aisle, side of the aisle you're on, uh, you could say that there are people who are quick to forget. And Mormon is putting this story in here for us to see that, hey, look, these guys were righteous. They just fought a war. There's a time of peace. Immediately, it seems like there's a guy that wants to overthrow the government. And he gets people on his side to be the king and so forth. So, verse 11. Moroni's approach is quite interesting. He's not going to have any of the civil unrest. Uh, they're going to they're going to take some very strong, powerful hands. No little local fighting. A strong arm where you're going to support our government or be uh, removed. In fact, it even gets stronger than that. If you'll notice verse 12, it's the great title of liberty. He makes them fly the flag and in their own world salute the flag and say you're going to fight for freedom. It's pretty interesting. Verse 40, with this civil unrest, you have, uh, in again, in today's world, it's almost, I don't know, amusing, but amazing how similar it is to today's world. Again, go to Alma 46, verse 40. And there were some who died with fevers. Uh, again, if you look in there, we have this civil unrest. We have people fighting. We have wars. And now we have diseases or fevers in this case. Uh, again, you can see the humor that it's exactly like it is today in so many ways. Let's move on to our next uh, chapter. Uh, chapter 47. Here, Amalekiah is going to do something. He wants power so bad, he's going to go to a foreign government to try to gain power and privilege. Again, you can laugh because there's on both sides of the aisle claims that people have done that today. Well, that's what Amalekiah is going to do. He goes and gets the Lamanites. His, and his purpose? To destroy the Nephites. In other words, I want to be the leader of the Nephites, but if I can't, I'm going to go get the Lamanites, and we're going to destroy the Nephites. That's how much he, apparently he loves his people. And he even marries the queen of the Lamanites in his strategy to get there. So, all's fair in love and war, I guess. Chapter 48, we have preparations of war. And chapter 49, we have the war. But notice what happens at the same time you have war. The church is strengthened. Maybe. Just maybe during this time of craziness uh, in the world we live in, we can see that maybe God has an underlying purpose to strengthen his own church. Let's go to chapter 50. Here's where I want to give parents and families uh, a principle to look for. At the very beginning of the chapter, Captain Moroni goes in quite some detail about how he's going to fortify his cities to prepare for the oncoming attacks. Can I invite you to go verse by verse in chapter 50 and see, okay, what does that look like in our home? In other words, where are the weak points? Where can the adversary get in our home? Is it through maybe the TV or our phones? Uh, how does he get in? And what can we do to put a barrier there? What can we do to build the walls higher? What can we do to throw stones off these vantage points? And, and who is it that we put on the towers to look out for our enemy? And you can have a really great discussion with this. If there's something that's been getting into your home, whether it's fighting or pornography or foul language or word of wisdom issues, whatever it might be, what can you do to fortify your home to protect against those things? It's a really You can have a really good family discussion with that. Also, when you go down to verses 35 and so forth, we introduce uh, Morianton and we introduce Tiancum in there. We have a battle amongst Tiancum, who was sent by Moroni to attack 
this Morianton, who is the the leader of these uh, evil people here. So let's take a look at chapter 51 now for a moment. Again, chapter 51, verse 8, tells us about a group that, again, who want to overthrow the government. Now, these were in favor of kings, were of high birth, and they sought to be kings, and they were supported by those who sought power and authority over the people. These are the kingmen. So we now have people who want to be kings and leaders. And then we have the other group, which is Chief Bahorn, which I mentioned. Let me put this back up here so you can see this. We'll go to this one here. Now over on the right, Nephiah, uh, he leaves and Pahorin is the new leader. So Pahorin is trying to put down the kingmen and keep it a, a system of judges. But these kingmen want to take over. So there is a lot that goes in there. At the end of chapter 51, Tiancum uh, is a very brave leader in this military. He's the one who sneaks out and actually kills the Lamanite king, Amalekiah. And he gets replaced, Amalekiah gets replaced by his brother, um, uh, Amaron. So we see a whole bunch in there, and that's in chapter 52. So there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of bouncing around. Hopefully this video can help you uh, keep some of the context in its proper place. Feel free to use this chart. You can print it out. You can screenshot it and say, okay, who's who, who's where. Add people to it, uh, all, all that you would like. Next week, we will look at this next section of the war chapters, Alma 53 through 63. Enjoy your reading and uh, may God bless you.